sort of like how to branch and why it's awesome and why emerging is cool and rebasing is weird but also cool and we're going to do kind of, you know, soup to nuts, how to learn Git. So I think it's not JavaScript at all, but if you've been using jQuery and contributing to all the open source, you really need to start knowing what's going on to say clone something. Um, the other one is uh, Evan, I can't remember his last name, is going to prevent, uh, present on Stativus, uh, which is a library he wrote. I think we'll all be really interested in it. It's, um, it's pretty complex stuff. Google's using it for some Canvas stuff. Um, so state management, right? Yeah, it's like Canvas state management, or they were using it in Canvas for their state management. Um, we're pretty excited about that. It should be a really good yeah. speaker. Um, and we're expecting a really big turnout for that one. Um, Scott from the... Scott Davis. Scott Davis from the HTML5 Roadshow uh, is going to be in town. That's probably in like, I think we're thinking more like six months out, but we're excited about that one. Yeah. And he's got his um, his sessions are coming through, so if you're looking for training or stuff like that, look up HTML5Roadshow.com. And you can sign up. It's paid workshops, but they look like they're pretty good. Yeah, so. and it's at the end of May. I believe so, like the twentieth, twenty second, somewhere in there. Yeah. So he's really funny too. So that helps. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and then the other one I wanted to announce, like the the barbecue coming up. Um, so annually we do like the WordPress, PHP, ECJQ barbecue at Fathom Gallery. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. I don't think there are prizes, but there's free food and merch. So, <laughs> what other do you do? There's swag, swag, that's yeah, right. I'll and do. we're considering off, all like raffling off a Bitcoin. So, <laughs> which, I mean, come on, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I could pass you a thumb drive and you could be rich or poor. Yeah. In a minute. Right? Okay, so, uh, so that's coming up too. Um, let me think. I think that's all I've got for meetup stuff coming up. Uh, and that'll probably be in June, right? The barbecue? Yeah, that's probably June. So. Keep yeah. that on your on your radar. Um, we've got a few more. Then I'll when, when's the Git workshop? I think we'll probably do it as the next one at this that's point. What I'm thinking. Unless we line up another speaker for May, we're doing Git. Because yeah, because you could claim that as being related to jQuery plugins. Because aren't they required to be in, in Git now? Um, yeah, sure. It's that almost a rule. <laughs> almost a rule. I mean, if, if, if you handed them a Git bucket URL, I don't. Know, they'd probably make fun of you. So yeah, sure, Git. That sounds right. Like it's not wrong. Um, okay, let's see. Other things. You have job announcements. We're hiring an SF Python engineer. So let that just wash over the jQuery group. Uh, that's, that's it. I actually filled my position that I was looking for like this afternoon. So I'm just going to step did. back well, from now. And I did. I'm really uh, happy. Well, I mean, pretty much the whole reason I'm here tonight is because I had a position that I need to fill desperately. Um, we lost a member of our team, and uh, and I need a designer and developer. So you Where know, you what's that? Oh, I work for the American Chemical Society. For those of you who don't know, that's the place that we've been hosting it for the last couple. Um, they're a good employer if you like 
stable hours, like 40 hour work weeks for real, no kidding. Um, we do that, so, and the paychecks come on time. We don't have tacos, we don't have foosball, but we do have paychecks and stable hours. <laughs> So, by the way, like the space you're in right now is Wapa Labs. That's where I work. We're part of the Washington Post Company, which is a shiny town across the street. Um, we split this space with another startup that the Washington Post Company owns called Social Code. And that's what we're going to get done. Yeah, so we're also looking for a um, designer, front end engineer, more, more front end engineer than anything. So Design, uh, yeah, kind of the same deal. Uh, 40 hours, really, like, no, no joke. Sometimes, actually, I work from home like two or three days a week, so it's kind of nice. Uh, everybody's really relaxed about that. Uh, the rates are super competitive, and you know, it's, it's a nice place to work. And we have a ton of really cool stuff that we're doing. You know, we need someone that can do like jQuery and backbone, that sort of stuff. So we're doing like really heavy front end projects. Um, that's, that's about it, yeah. So yeah, Rodrigo's gonna throw his um, email Yeah, up. I wanna put my email address up there. If any of you is interested or has any yeah. questions or anything, please just feel free. Did anybody else have any job announcements or openings that they would like to fill? Really? Great. Um, at MyStrategy Labs, we're looking for a front-end developer as well. Uh, JavaScript heavy, looking for somebody with uh, no experience. That kind of stuff is on our uh, careers page at iStrategyLabs.com. Um, you can also email um, John, who's our VP of, uh, who's the director of engineering, so John at iStrategyLabs, and no H. Um, so, yeah. For a job at a place that needs a UX be combined with a front end engineer and possibly back engineer and possibly networking person. Mm -hmm. Sit one seat close to Rodrigo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I kind of lied. The whole reason I'm here really tonight is because uh, this guy, Trevor Davis, his work is awesome. Um, I don't know if you've uh, seen his portfolio site, but it is superb. And, um, he's going to give us a really good talk. Is there anything else going on? Without further ado, yeah. Yep. Right sure. I'm here for I don't know if I should stand. stand. Can you guys see if I stand? Is that cool? All right, so tonight I want to talk to you guys about um, JavaScript for non web apps. Um, first off, can everybody hear me in the back? Okay. A little louder. A little louder? Okay. All right, so first off, I'm Trevor Davis. I'm a senior front end developer at Vigit. Um, we're a web agency based out of Falls Church, uh, Virginia, and then we also have an office in Durham, North Carolina, and Boulder, Colorado. Um, and so what we're going to cover tonight, um, 
as I heard from a lot of the people that are looking for uh, employees, it's the news and the JavaScript community is all about like Backbone and Node and MVC frameworks and stuff like that. But I feel like 90% of what I do as a front end developer is just building like marketing style websites, not web apps. Um, so really, this is where jQuery shines and just like doing DOM manipulation and animation and stuff like that. So really, I wanted to take you through the whole process of writing um, and executing JavaScript for a non-web app. So what we're going to cover first, we're going to talk about JavaScript basics and best practices, um, the anatomy of a jQuery plugin, jQuery plugin patterns, and JavaScript execution patterns. Oh, also, if anyone has questions, don't feel like you have to save, save it till the end. I mean, there's going to be code on the screen, so if you have a question about code, don't wait all the way to the end, because then we've got to go all the way the back. So first, I want to talk about JavaScript basics and best practices. I have that in quotes because I kind of just want to talk about some key concepts that some people may know, some people may not know, um, that we're going to use in our plugin development. And then best practices are just kind of some of our internal standards and best practices that we enforce internally. So first, we're just going to start with simple variable naming. All JavaScript variables are camel case. So that means the first character is lowercase, and then the next character that starts the next word is uppercase. Except for a class or a constructor, which are title case, and that just means the first character is uppercase instead of lowercase. All jQuery objects are, are prefixed with a dollar sign. Um, I know this is one that a lot of people do, but some people don't because they think it makes your JavaScript messy. Um, but really, we do this because it's really easy to identify what is a jQuery object just by looking at the variable name. And then last, uh, variables are declared at the start of the scope, on their own line, and with their own var keyword. This one is even uh, controversial internally. Uh, we had a debate about it, I think, just last week. And it almost got as bad as like a tabs versus spaces debate. But I don't want to talk about that. Um, you should just use tabs, and we're going to move on. <laughs> All right, so here's a couple examples of variable names. So the first example is just a variable named is ready, lowercase i, capital R. The next one is a function, lowercase c, capital H. The next one is a jQuery object, so we have a prefix with a dollar sign. And then after that, we have a constructor. So that's where we have the capital letter, and we have title case come in. And then below that, we're just creating an object, and that's just a lowercase t. So next, when let's say, talk. When you say constructor, is it like a class constructor, or what is different? So JavaScript doesn't really have classes, but it's basically a class. Well, we're going to get to that in more detail, what that means. So let's talk about anonymous functions. I feel like when jQuery first came out, you saw so many anonymous functions all over the place. And the way we look at it is, if you can avoid anonymous functions by using a named one, it's going to make your code clearer. So the first example, we're just grabbing um, elements of the class of row, and we're doing an each. And we have an anonymous function where we're looping through all of our items in the jQuery collection. We're storing our columns variable. Um, then we're storing a max height variable. And then we have another each inside of that where we're looping through each column inside of that. So that's another anonymous function. So inside of that, we're just calculating the value of what the height should be. And then below that, we're setting the column of each one to be the maximum height. It's OK. There's two anonymous functions. But it could be better. So if you look at the lower example, we're actually creating two named functions. So here we have a function that's <coughs> called equalize height. And that's basically the same exact function as the first anonymous function. So when we get down here at the bottom, we say dot row each equalize height. It's much clearer when you look at that as to what that's doing versus just an anonymous function. So by naming your functions, you can easily look at your code and see what the JavaScript is doing. And then inside of that, we have another function called set max height. And when we use that down below, we're saying columns each set max height. It's just much clearer what you're doing than just a whole bunch of anonymous functions. So if you can, avoid them and use named functions. There are still instances where it makes sense to use an anonymous function because you have like one line inside of it or something like that. And that's OK. It's fine to have some. Just don't go overboard. So let's talk about just function, functions in general. We, we try to keep functions short and specific so they have a certain task and they're executing that task. 
and it's ideal if you can use functions that return values. So let's look at an example. So let's say we have a big long document and then inside of that, or in that document we have some links that are pointing to an anchor tag with a class of footnote and they also have a data attribute. And so let's say on this page we want to grab all of the links with a class of footnote and we want to store them in an object so that down below we can output all of them and display what the footnotes are. So by using some functions that return values, you can make your code a lot cleaner. So first we start by just defining a footnotes object. Then below that we're defining a get hash function. Below that we're defining a get text function. And here's an example of where I am using a anonymous function. You could, I guess, technically break this to a separate function, but it only has so much room on the screen. So here we're looping through all items with a class of footnote, and we're saying for each one, we want to store the copy of the jQuery object, and we want to get keys and values. So for the key variable, we're calling the get hash function and passing the jQuery object of this. So if we look in our get hash function, we have a function with a parameter of link, and all we're doing is we're returning the href on that link, and we're just removing the pound sign. So we just want what comes after the pound sign. So if we look here, we want footnote one and footnote two. We don't want the pound sign. So that gives us our key value. And then val is basically the same thing. We're calling the get text function. And all that function is doing is just returning the data attribute of data footnote. So if we look here, we have our data footnote, and that's what that function returns. And so all we're doing is storing these values on an object, and our output looks something like this. So then we can have another piece of JavaScript where we're just looping through this object and it's just outputting the items on the page. So by using functions that return values, you can keep your functions short and meaningful. Well, um, is there any reason for assigning basically an anonymous function to the variable rather than the more C syntax for the naming the function? So just saying function? Uh, no, like function get hash parentheses. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, so then you have to deal with like hoisting, and that can get messy. So the way that we name, I don't want to try and explain hoisting, um, but the way that we name functions is like this, so that you know the function has been defined before you try and call it. If you use the other syntax, you can really have that function anywhere in your code before you call it, because it gets hoisted up to the top of the scope. So the, we <coughs> prefer to write functions like this. You could easily write it the same way, and it would do the exact same. We could, you could write that way and really? the exact same. Can you reuse this code? Like you write, you're writing the get hash here, but if you want to uh, call it from somewhere else, is it possible? Yeah, you something? could you could call that get hash function somewhere else, and it would return all you pass it is um, a jQuery object, and it would return that value for you. So that's another good point. It makes your code more reusable by having functions that are shorter and return values. Would uh, uh, you guys make a? Do you write a lot of custom jQuery plugins? Like, would that be a good example of making like a? plug-in for that? Or? Uh, yeah, you can definitely make a plug-in of this. Um, we, we make, I don't know, we have like a good mix. Like we write a lot of just custom JavaScript where it's not in the plug-in, and then a lot of stuff that is in the plug-in just, I don't know what the line is, it just kind of depends on the reuse and how you're going to use it. Um, but we do a lot of custom plugins as well. Yeah? Why do you prefer uh, that syntax versus uh, what you said, uh, the other syntax is hoists it. Well, why is that advantageous but not um, subject to hoist? Um, why is it advantageous? I don't know. Okay. It's just kind of the standard we just decided on, so everyone it. It sticks to the same thing. Okay. Um, and it's really just because so you know that you've defined your function before you try and call it. That's the reason we do it. Yep. How do you feel about um, returning this? As a as a standard for for functions that don't really return anything really specific. Yeah, um, I get to that later. Talking about chainability to make functions chainable, um, we do it a lot. I yeah. thought of a reason to avoid hoisting. Yeah. So that you won't wait for the for everything to have been uh, that could have called it to have, have been, uh, you you know that it exists. So therefore, you can use it right away afterwards. There you go. Also, when you minify your code, you can use that function a lot, then it's a lot smaller bytes going down the line. 
Okay. Um, a simple one. Possibly in all browsers, but certainly older browsers. If your function is declared in an assignment statement, like var get hash equals function and also a name, it's possible for the function to be evaluated two times. <coughs> Once at the hoist level, prior to the execution of the code in like order, and the second time when it actually runs. So it's kind of inconsistent and weird. Glad we have smarter people than me here that can say these things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, we sort of saw it, but let's talk about object literals. Um, this is the syntax for creating an object um, and defining properties on an object. So we're here, we just have a variable called my object, and then we're defining properties on that object. So we have a string prop, and the value is here's a string, a num prop, the value is 11, a boolean prop, the value is true, and then we can also have functions um, on an object. So here we have my function as a property on that object. And the way you access um, these properties is using dot notation. So in that first, the first example is my object dot num prop, and that equals 11. <coughs> You can also use um, bracket notation, which looks more like an array. And so that's my object, bracket, and then in quotes, the string of the property that you want to access. There are certain instances where you need to use that, like if you name your object class or something like that, you can't just use dot class since that's a reserved word. But typically we prefer dot notation over bracket notation. Um, and then down below is just an example of how you would call a function on an object. You just need the parentheses to run the function. So now we're going to talk about um, object prototypes. This is where we sort of JavaScript doesn't have classes, but this is kind of the best we can do to replicate classes. So we've got a couple different pieces here. We've got a constructor and a prototype. So our constructor here, we're creating a variable called person, and it's just a function that accepts a name parameter. Then inside of that, we're just assigning the parameter of name to that um, object. And then down below we have a prototype where we're defining all the methods on that class or object or constructor or whatever you want to call it. And here we just have one method called greet, which is a function. And all it does is it console.logs hello and then the name of the object. So down below when we say var bob equals new person and we pass it a string of Robert, that means that it's gone through our constructor and then when we call bob.greet, it calls the greet method on the prototype. So then it just console.logs hello Robert. So that's the basic idea of how object prototype works in JavaScript. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. <coughs> namespacing. Um, so typically when we develop a site, uh, a marketing style site, we have a single namespace where we're putting everything on. So we don't want to clutter the global namespace with lots of random variables or objects or whatever. So we typically use like a three or four letter abbreviation of the site name. So I just did a site for World Wildlife Fund. It was just, the namespace was just WWF. Um, so here we define our namespace. We're sending window.site, or if that doesn't exist, then site is just an empty object. And typically we do this because if you have like a lot of different JavaScript files, you always want to have access to that namespace and have access to all the properties on that object. And then here's an example of just what the object might look like. We would have an init method and then another method on there. Typically we have a lot more than that, but this is just a brief example. Why why the type <laughs> at the top do you use window.site and then just site yeah. on the first line? Brevity? I mean you could you could either do it you could do it the other way. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So window dot when you say window is are you referring the window object or yes. Yeah, the window it's object itself. Name. It's a global namespace, yeah. Okay. So we try to have only one object on the global namespace. And, and site is your, you can call it site or you can call it? You can it call it whatever you want. Um, so like for WWF, we call it WWF. For Puma, we call it Puma. Um, and for, we usually just pick three or four letters, something that's easy to okay. remember. Yep. Sorry, um, can I ask a question on the prototype? Sure. Why can't you put the function in the constructor? What's the advantage of creating a prototype? Um, I don't know. This is where it gets like beyond me. But um, somebody might have an answer. I think in the constructor you are assigning the values to the, you are creating the object, uh, instance of an object. And here you are know, defining the, the functionality. Function, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I don't think you, I don't know if you can define the function. You, you can do, do this dot prototype. Yeah. Yeah. 
it, it becomes important when you start to chain the prototypes because the when you if you if this object doesn't find the function that it looks like its prototype. And if it doesn't right. find it there, then it looks like its prototype, but it never goes back to a non-prototype object in the chain. So if you put it in the constructor. The, the constructor, then it can't be used by things that extend it. Gotcha. There you go. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think you can, you can yeah. mutate the prototype after you created something, and the things you already created right. get yeah. it. Right. Whereas the constructor doesn't yeah. get called again. Yes. Yeah. Is there yeah. a reason why you don't? Sorry. Uh, sorry, on the next slide. Sorry. Is there a reason why you don't use the window.site uh, later on when you define it? Uh, the window.site returns a if it returns a false CD value, right? Then it executes the uh, creates a new yeah. site. Then you don't use window dot there. Is it because it's implied or? Yeah, I mean it's the same thing. You could write window.site. Go for it. If you do window.site in the first like the very first um, expression, because you're asking for a property on the object. If it's null or undefined, or if it's undefined, actually, you won't get an error. But if you just done site and then two pipes, you could get like a, a error because there's no variable that's been defined to that. But as far as assignment goes, if you do an assignment in the global scope, no var first, it goes on the window object directly. So you could have done like a window dot has a property in the string of site or some other thing that wouldn't would cause an error there. But window dot site is more brief. Yeah, it's really for brevity. It's just a simple line at the top of each JavaScript file. Somebody else had a question? Yeah. Why would you do like person dot prototype dot three equals function? Uh, I'm just assuming there's multiple methods on the prototype. I guess I could have written it like that, but just assuming that you're usually adding multiple methods on the prototype versus just one. So assuming you could put a comma after, you could put a <coughs> comma here and then say like goodbye and create another function on there. So you're just creating an object literal with all of the methods for that object. Yeah. Um, how do you typically handle uh, inheritance with this kind of? You don't really end up for like marketing style sites. That's mm -hmm. kind of how we run into things like web apps definitely. But at that point, jQuery is probably not the best tool for a web app. Um, but we really don't use much inheritance. Uh, you don't have to. It's built into JavaScript to do, to do the inheritance through prototype. But say you wanted to have another class called main, right? Right. That has the Greek function already and uh, has another property. Yeah. There's some other tool. Like there's a, it's like a class polyfill kind of that kind of makes inheritance for JavaScript that we used before. We just don't. We just don't end up doing it a lot. <coughs> don't really have to deal with that. Cool. All right, so let's talk about closures. Um, so closure, this is basically designed to kind of protect your code. So first we start with a semicolon um, at, in the front. Um, and this is really uh, for your own safety if you're like con concatenated and minifying all your files. Somebody in the code before you could have forgotten semicolons or forgotten to do something that could mess up your code. So you can never have too many semicolons in JavaScript. So you can just throw one in there just for protection. You just put five in no. the beginning and at oh, the end. Sure, why not? <laughs> Don't set my phone. Oh, are you one of the three? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you might have to leave. You might have to leave. <laughs> but that's the other thing. You always put semicolons in your JavaScript. That's how, that's how we do it. Sure. And they're not needed by you. It's debatable. Yeah. We're not going to get into that argument here. <laughs> All right, so next we have what's called a self-invoking function. And what we're doing here is we're, defi we're defining a function and then basically calling the function immediately after. So this is ideal if you're developing a site with jQuery and maybe your client two weeks down the line is going to throw in prototype or something like that. That also maps the dollar sign. So here we're protecting the dollar sign inside of this closure so that it always maps to jQuery. Um, and then passing the other arguments of window and document are kind of just a good practice, passing those things. And in case anyone else decides to muck with them, they're always available to you. Um, and so that's the closure. Why the undefined? He only gives things. three parameters when he calls it. And so the fourth one becomes uh, so short. It's possible to define Yeah, you can, you can define undefined. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I know. That's guaranteed. So it's just, prote just yeah, so, protection. So oh, the within this scope undefined yeah. is undefined. Yeah. Because if, 
That socket is not <laughs> actually I really have seen some third party yeah. code? It's <laughs> really bad. <laughs> so it's just kind of as much as you can, just protect yourself from your scope. That's kind of the way we look at stuff. Okay. All right, so that's enough of just kind of basics. Yeah. When I need to use the closure? When do you need to use a closure? Yeah. Um, always. That's kind of how we do it. If you're writing JavaScript, it should be in a closure. Because you don't know what's going to happen potentially with that JavaScript down the line. My might as well just kind of protect it. Do you want to kind of zombie for using Clojure? Um, we're going to talk about it more in developing plugins. Like it's used in all of the examples. Is that enough, or do you need more? Okay. So, so you would put your your window.site or site equals empty object inside. Um, we would usually have that outside, and then everything else uh, inside. I guess you can move it inside though, and be fine. Just referencing the same object. Yeah. All right. So now let's talk about um, just kind of the anatomy of jQuery plugins. Kind of the most important part is just adding a method to the fn object. Um, that is how it's pronounced, so don't try and say anything else. <laughs> so that gives us the ability to create a jQuery object and then call a method on it by adding something to the fn namespace. So that's as simple as just doing this. Dollar sign dot fn dot plugin name is a function. And so we're just adding a new method to the dollar sign dot fn object. Now, to maintain chainability, it makes it so you don't have to do something like this. You don't have to say dot something dot CSS color red dot something show dot something plugin name. You can simplify that and just say dot something dot CSS color red dot show dot plugin name. And the reason that works is because we're returning this, so the scope is always returned back, so that same scope gets executed on in the next function. So you can't really talk about plugins without talking about options. All plugins, well, not all plugins, but for the most part, all plugins will take some sort of option so you can configure the plugin to do what you want it to do. So basically, options is just an object literal that we're passing into our method. So in this example, we're just passing an object. The first property is one, its value is something. The second property is two, the value is another thing. And it's as easy um, to customize your plugin to accept options <coughs> by just throwing in options in that function as a parameter. So since we're just calling a function and passing a parameter, you have access to that options object inside your plugin. You can't really talk <coughs> about options without having defaults. So the common way of defining your defaults is just, again, creating an object literal, and we're just throwing it onto the, our plugin object. We're just saying one is something, two is another thing. And then what we do with those options and defaults is we merge them together. So inside the plugin, here we're creating another ob object called ops, and we're using jQuery extend. So what jQuery extend does is it works from left to right, and it merges options or merges objects together. So first we start with an empty object, and then we merge that with our default object. Then we merge that, the result of that, with the options object. So you're returned a single object that has just merged all of these objects together. So let's look at what... Why are you the empty object? So, um, so, you're, so you don't alter your default. If you don't put the empty object, you'll, you'll oh, alter the first So the first, thing, the first item is the item that actually gets mutated and returned. Right. Yeah, okay. so if you put the, your, your defaults first, then you'd be right. overwriting your... I, I, didn't know, I, didn't, I didn't know extend mutated something. I thought it was creating something. So let's look at what that does. So we first start with our empty object, and then we have our defaults here and our options. And then once we run extend, it's going to merge the empty object with defaults, and it's going to take defaults and merge it with options. So since in our options we only have a single property, it's going to take that value of 1 and put it up there. So we have our new value on 1, and we have our default value for 2. So that's the result after the extend. So that way you can keep your defaults and your options, and then you can work within your plugin. So jQuery plugins are great because they work multiple times on a page. Um, and really, that's as easy as just saying this.each, and then inside of that this.each is where you're running all the code. So it's iterating over each item in the jQuery collection. So when we put all that together, it looks like this. 
First we have our closure, and inside of that we're adding our uh, method to the fn namespace, and we're, it's just a function that takes options. And the next line is doing our extend, so we have our, our values to use. And then we have our this.each function, which is iterating over each item in the jQuery collection, and that's where all the plugin code goes. And then down below we're just returning this, and down below that is where we're just storing all of our default object or default options. So now we're going to talk about some jQuery plugin patterns. Um, there's lots of different ways to create plugins. Um, I'm kind of going to focus just on my favorite um, because it's my favorite. Um, so there's kind of the old way. Uh, we kind of looked at it already, but this is how plugins have been written kind of since the start of jQuery. Um, it's fine, it works, but there's better ways. So let's look at what that looks like. Uh, we're going to step through it and break it down into small pieces. So first, we saw before, we're going to create a constructor. So here we're just creating a variable called plugin. It's a function that takes two arguments, an element and options. And so inside of that, we're just storing the value of the element on the object, and we're storing a jQuery um, object of that element. Then we're also grabbing the options. And then the next line is for storing metadata, which I'm going to get to in more detail. But really, that's just grabbing a data attribute off of the element. And I'll show you where that comes into play later. And then next, we're defining our prototype. So we've set up our defaults. And then we have an init method. Inside of that init method, we're, doing, we're creating a new object called this.config, where we're extending our empty object with our defaults, with our options, and then this time with metadata. Again, I'll get to that later. And then we're returning this to maintain chainability. And so now when we're adding it to the fn namespace, all we're doing is we're, again, adding, an, uh, adding a method to the fn object. And it's just a function that takes options. And inside of that, we're doing a return this.each, so it loops over each item in the collection. And we're just saying new plugin, and we're passing it the element itself and the options, and we're calling the init method. So basically, for each item in the collection, we're instantiating our plugin. So here's how we put it all together. Um, we've got our closure, then we have our constructor above, <coughs> then we have our prototype, and then we have where we're adding it to the fn namespace. And this is, I didn't come up with a name, I swear, um, a highly configurable and mutable plugin. I don't know why it's called that. Um, there's a really good article on Smashing Magazine that like define, talks through a lot of different jQuery plugin patterns. And this is the one that kind of stood out to us, and so this is the one we've been utilizing. So why do we use this pattern? Um, it's really portable, because you can easily take that class or the object and make it available on the window if you wanted to by just doing window.plugin equals plugin. And then somebody else can use all that functionality you've created outside of the jQuery plugin itself if they wanted to. It's better organized because you're not just throwing a crap ton of code inside of the this.each. It's kind of all broken out into a separate constructor and prototype. So the logic is outside of the jQuery plugin itself. Because if we look at that, it's really these five lines that's adding it to the jQuery plugin. All of this is just straight up JavaScript. We might be using jQuery inside of that, but that's just JavaScript and it's not all just jQuery code. So there's also better customization. Um, you could do it with the old plugin pattern too, which is not as nice. And you can specify options for every each element individually. So let's finally look at an example. So I took this example from a site um, that I'm currently working on, kind of tweaked it a little bit to make it better for the presentation and shorter. Um, so we're building this responsive site and there's a bunch of these elements with a class of tabs, and they're just lists of links. And so they're horizontally across the page. You know, as your window gets smaller, they don't always fit on the screen. So what we decided to do in certain situations is to just create a select element, and then just use that select to decide which link you're going to target. So we end up, we typically want something like this on smaller screens. We want to use the select, and then you choose the option, and then you go to that link. You could just duplicate the code, and you could have this on the page, immediately followed by that. That's kind of gross. Um, so I ended up writing a little JavaScript to just create this select on the fly. 
And for some reason, I started out by just making it a class and not a plugin. Um, I don't really know why, but it's easy to just take that class and adapt it to a plugin, so it ended up working out. Can everyone see that in the back? I think this is as small as it ends up getting. Yeah? yeah. Um, so first, we're just creating a class. So we're saying window.listSelect is a function, and it takes two parameters, um, mm -hmm. an element and options. And then the first three lines should look familiar. We've done it in a bunch of examples. Then next, we're storing all of the links inside of that element. So basically what we're saying is the element that gets passed in, find all of the anchor tags inside of it and store it in this variable. And since we're going to create a select, we're going to start a string that's just this.selectHTML. And so far, it's just going to be the, op the opening select tag. So that's our constructor defined. Now inside of our prototype, um, first we start with an init method. And the first thing we're doing is we're looping over each of the links, and we want to get the values for each of the links to add to the select. So what we're doing is we're calling this.links.each, and we're actually using jQuery proxy here to change the context. Um, so you can use other tools instead of using jQuery proxy. You can use bind, and that's not jQuery bind, that's just JavaScript bind. Um, it's just not supported in uh, IE8 and below. So what proxy does is if you just ran this that each, this that links that each, this that build select, that means the context of this inside build select will be the actual link itself. In this case, it's referring back to the object, so we have access to all of the um, properties that we've defined on the object. So if we jump down to build select, here, build select takes two parameters, an index and element. And this is kind of just stuff jQuery each gives you for free. So here we're saying var l is the actual element. So that's where we're defining that's the link. And then since we want to have access to this, the original context, we do this.selecthtml, and then we're just doing some string concatenation. We're just creating, uh, creating an option for each link, where we're just saying the value is the href. And then the text inside of it is just the text from the link. So what that's going to do is that's going to loop through each of those links and add an option for each one. And then once that's done, we just want to close our select. Since we've got all of our options, just add our closing select tag. So now that we've, all, we've got all of our select HTML, what we do is we create a jQuery object out of that select HTML. So we just say this dot dollar sign select is a jQuery object with all of that HTML that we just built with a string. And then since we have options passed in, um, this is where we check to see if the class property was set on the options. And you'll notice that I'm using bracket notation here because I use the variable class, and that's a defined word you can't do that. Um, so we say, if that's set, then we want to add the class to the select element itself. Then once we've done that, we want to insert it after the original element. And then we also want to bind events. And then after that, we return this to maintain chainability. So inside bind events, yeah, inside bind events, what we're doing is we're saying, on change of the select, we want to call this this dot redirect method. So you'll notice that I'm not just saying on change; I'm actually namespacing my events. So this is useful um, so that if you need to access all of your events and unbind them real quickly or you need to trigger something, you can actually just do dot, you can call dot trigger and then pass in your namespace. And you can trigger all events on all your events with a namespace. So it's just kind of clean to keep your events namespace, kind of the same way we keep our all of our JavaScript objects namespace. You might as well just take advantage of that functionality and namespace your events. So on change of our select, we're going to call the this that redirect method. And all that's doing is saying redirect, and that's just doing window.location, this.val. And so the context of this here is the select element. And so that's why we don't need to use uh, proxy here, because we actually want the context of this to be the select element. You could use proxy if you wanted to, and then you could use this.select instead of this. But it just makes sense in this case not to change the context. So the way we would call this class like this. We would just create a new variable called tab select. We would say, OK, we want new list select. And we, the first item that we pass is the jQuery object of tabs, and that's the element. 
and then next we have the options, and the options is just the class of tab select, and then we call the init method. So you didn't need to re so it was, al it was already a jQuery object, then, right? You didn't if you go back to the other slide? You mean that part up top? Yeah, you need to do that, because it's already a, if you put a dollar sign in your or, yeah, I guess you can do either one. Right? right, you could. You could use just like regular query selector if you wanted to select the element, or you could just quickly select it um, with with the dollar sign tabs like that. <coughs> but there, I mean, there are some shortcomings to doing it like that. For one thing, you need a loop to handle multiple tab elements. <laughs> so if we look back here, if we look back here, we're passing in tabs, and that could be multiple items on a page. But since we don't have a this, that, each anywhere in here. It's only going to do it once. So it's kind of a shortcoming of doing it like this, um, that you need a loop to handle multiple tabs elements. And technically, we're also cluttering the global namespace. Um, you don't have to make this jQuery plugin to fix this. You could just throw it onto um, our site namespace that we've got. But just for this example, I just bound it to the window. So what we would have to do if we wanted to change this to work with our um, with multiple tab elements, is we would just have a tabs and then an each method where we loop over each item in the jQuery collection. And then you'll notice that the first parameter that we're passing is no longer a jQuery object, it's just this. So that's why that's why in the uh, class itself I was creating storing a copy of the jQuery object. Yeah. So but what are we really here? We're here to make it a plugin <coughs> because it really didn't make sense to do it like that. So it was pretty easy to adapt and make it a plugin. So here we start with a lot of things that look, should look familiar. Uh, we have our closure, and then we have our plugin constructor. You'll notice that we're not defining it on the window anymore. We're just keeping it as a local um, list select variable. So the first three lines should look similar, should look familiar since we've done them so many times. And then next, we're getting the metadata, which I'm finally going to get to that, I promise. Um, where we're just getting a data attribute off of the element itself. And then we're getting our links, our select HTML. Then we're defining our defaults. And the inside of the init, this is where it's a little different um, because we didn't really have defaults defined in the original class. So what we're doing is we're going from an empty object, merging with the defaults, merging with the options, and then merging with the metadata. And then the rest of this um, init function is exactly the same. And then so all these functions are the same too. Bind events is the same, build select, redirect, etc. And down below, all we're doing is we're just throwing it onto the uh, dollar sign that fn namespace. So really all of this code was just ripped right from the original class. And then just those five lines down there are really what makes it a jQuery plugin. So that gives me the ability to just say dollar sign dot tabs list select, that's our plugin name. And then we pass it our options object with tab select. So all that's going to do is it's going to loop through each item with a class of tabs, and it's going to append a select after it with a class of tab select. Does the uh, jQuery selector always return an array, even if it's just one? Good question. I think so. Talking about uh, when you init a jQuery object with a, with a selector? Yes. It's always an array. Yeah. When you define it with your script tag, no. It's, a, it, it's not an array yet, but it, it has, I think it has a length of zero, but it doesn't, it's not actually right. an array yet. Yep. All right, so now we're finally going to talk about these per element options. So let's say you have like five of these lists on a page, um, and they all need to be the same, they all need to do the exact same thing, <coughs> except maybe you have one that you want to have a different class on it. So instead of calling the jQuery plugin twice, saying, with a different class on the separate one that you want to have a different class on, you can use these per element options that I've been talking about. So what we're doing is we're adding a data attribute, a data list select options, and then it's just a JSON object inside of that. And basically all that's doing is it's just taking that object and inside of the plugin, it's the last step in the extend. So it's using that to merge with our defaults and options and it's overwriting any special values that we passed in. So here we've said we want the class to be new class. Even if we call this tab select on that element, <coughs> we're going to get a select with a class of new class. So it's really great that you can 
customize the options per element. The only thing that bothers me is that you have to use single quotes on the HTML. I don't like that. But in the rare instances that I need to use something like this, it's yeah. okay. You already have data dash select, uh, list select uh, options, and when you got to the code, it's a data object with a select list options. Yeah, so there's a there's a data method um, on there's a jQuery data method, oh, okay. and you just pass it in everything it, it knows separate data. data dash convention. Yep, and you can also access it like attribute data right. dash, okay. but you can also store data on the object that isn't an actual attribute. Yeah. So you can just throw a bunch of data on the object on an element that you want to use, and it doesn't ever show up on the, like in the actual DOM. It's just stored and as data. If you reference the same attribute two different ways, the one will change the value in data, and the other one will stay the same. So it's, it's yeah, it can get. You, you want to use one or the other. <laughs> yes. um, why do you use camel case for list select? Where um, for list select dash options? Sorry. Oh, uh, I don't know. Convention uh, since because it matches the plugin name. Um, see how we call it list select? So we usually okay. just take the plugin name and insert it and then do dash options. Okay. All right, so what have we learned from this piece? Um, it's ideal to keep your plugin functionality outside of jQuery instantiation. It means you keep it separate, it makes it really easy to reuse those classes, and you can use it kind of outside of jQuery plugins. Don't be scared of using a lot of methods. It's better to have lots of smaller methods, in our opinion. People may argue that you would rather have that calling methods as overhead, but in our opinion, it doesn't add enough that you should have long, complex methods. Also, namespace your events. It makes it a lot easier to unbind them or trigger them or do whatever you want. It's just cleaner. And then it's easy to make this functionality available to jQuery plugins and for vanilla JavaScript use kind of at the same time. So now that we know how to write jQuery plugins, like what's the best way to execute all the JavaScript on your site? Um, these next few techniques, they're all assuming that all of your JavaScript for the whole site is concatenated and minified and just loaded on every page. There's obviously different techniques for this. You can use script loaders and so forth, but the most common thing we usually do is just kind of throw it all together and throw it on the page. Um, so that's what we're gonna use for this example. So the first thing is just kind of throwing everything in document.ready. So we've got our document.ready, call our tabs plugin, call our carousel, call our slider. This is how we used to write JavaScript and jQuery when kind of jQuery first came out and I really didn't have much of an idea what I was doing. Um, so you're kind of just calling plugins for elements. They may exist on the page, they may not. jQuery is cool because it fails silently so you're not gonna get any errors. Um, I still see a lot of people doing this today though and it kind of makes me sad because there's much, much better ways to do this. So the first example we're going to look at is what's called DOM-based routing. Um, this is Paul Irish um, wrote an article about this technique back in 2009. And he initially called it something really long and complex. And I have it the full name on my last <coughs> side, but it's much longer. And so he later said he would have called it DOM-based routing. So the idea is that you use the class and ID elements on the body to tell you what JavaScript to trigger. So in this case, we have a class of shopping and an ID of cart. And so then we have our big site object, our site namespace, that has a bunch of methods on it. So we have a common object and a shopping object. Inside of the common object, we have an init method and a finalized method. Inside of shopping, we have an init method, a cart method, and a category method. So by having the class be shopping and the ID be cart, the way he wrote the JavaScript is that it would fire the site common.init because that gets fired on every page load regardless of what the ID and class are. And then it calls site shopping init, and that's where you get the class um, tells you which object to operate on. And they call site shopping cart because that's the class and the ID. And then finally it just calls site common finalized because that's the last thing that, get, that got called in the way he wrote the JavaScript. So you would load that page, and these are the four methods that would load. And then inside of like shopping.init, you would put all your code anytime you would use the shopping class that would be used inside of there. And then you would put your cart specific code inside of the cart method. That was cool, we used that a couple times. And then my coworker, um, Jason Garber, 
was working on a Rails project and wanted more structure to it that sort of maps to what Rails did well. So it was maybe, I don't know, a year after Paul Irish talked about his technique, Jason kind of came up with this other technique um, where he uses data attributes and uses Rails controller and action to define which methods to call. So let's say in this example we're looking at a user's show page. Then we go back to our object here. We have our site comment init method. That gets fired first. And then we also have this users object down here. Since the controller is users, it's going to call the site users init method. And then since we're on users show, it's going to call the site users show method. So you can really break your JavaScript into specific functionality based on controllers and actions. And it would fire these three methods. Um, Jason didn't have a finalized method, but you could easily do that as well. So I use this technique a bunch. Um, I did it when we were doing the Puma website. Um, it was really great because it broke out the specific code that I needed for like the products index and the product show and like the media index and the media show. And it worked really, really great at that time. But as we've kind of evolved and we kind of, our designs are different, we're building things differently, everything's more modular, it's less page specific. Uh, we do what's called feature-based execution. So like I said, it's more modular, and it's feature-specific instead of page-specific. So it's easier to add existing features to pages without having any JavaScript. Like you, you build your client all these JavaScript features, and then they can figure out which pages need which features. So the way we do it is we have a data features attribute on the body. And we just have a space separated list of features to execute. It doesn't have to be space separated, and you can use whatever you want. We just kind of treated it like the way class, the class attribute is, it's just space separated. So then on our site namespace, we have a big features object. And inside of this features object, we have another object for each feature um, on the site. So we have a filters object, a modal, a ta tabs, a timeline. And each one of those objects have an init method on them. So on this site that features um, object, we also have an init method. And what this init method is doing is first we're grabbing the features off of the body, um, the data attribute, and then we're going to create a features array. So if features exist, we want to throw those values into an array and we're splitting on a space. And next we're going to loop through that array and fire those functions. So we're doing a for loop, and then inside of each one, we're just creating, storing the function name as a variable. And then we're checking to make sure that it exists and that the init method is an actual function, so you don't get any JavaScript errors. And then we're calling this function.init. So since we have our JavaScript set up, that's like we have a site.init that's firing on document.ready, inside of that init, we're calling site.features.init. I, this object will usually be much bigger and there's more stuff happening in a knit. So this is just for the example. And then once we call the features.init, it's going to fire these init functions for each feature. So it's going to call the timeline JavaScript and the tabs JavaScript and the filters JavaScript and modal JavaScript. So you're really only specifically calling features that are on the page. You're not just throwing a bunch of stuff at the DOM and hoping it sticks. So this is a technique we probably use on most of our marketing sites. Um, and I've actually been playing with a slight variation of it um, using a script loader. So the idea is that you break your features all out into separate files, um, and then you load each feature JavaScript with a script loader, and then you're not loading any unused JavaScript. In this world of more responsive design, more mobile devices, that means there's going to be a smaller initial load of JavaScript. And then the initial page, the initial scripts will all be loaded asynchronously. So in this example, I'm just using the YepNote script loader. You could substitute your favorite script loader. And what I'm saying is I want to load the scripts, features, and then the name of the uh, feature, so timeline.js. And that's going to load the timeline.javascript file, which contains the entire feature object for that JavaScript. And then on complete of load of that file, we check to make sure that it exists and that the init method is a function, and we call that function. So thrown into place here, um, we're doing the same thing. 
We're grabbing our data attributes, we're looping over an, an array, and for each loop of the array, we're gonna load a small JavaScript file and call the init method. So what did we learn kind of overall from this section? Um, don't just haphazardly fire a bunch of JavaScript functions that may or may not be used. Come up with a pattern um, for triggering your JavaScript on each site that makes sense for your site. Don't just throw everything document.ready. Don't just fire a bunch of functions. Come up with a pattern that works for your marketing site and the way that you're building the site so you're only executing the JavaScript that you need. Thanks. Anybody have any questions, comments? Want to talk about other stuff? Yeah. I have a question. Do you go a couple of slides back? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're talking about feature based. So uh, go forward one. Uh, one. Yeah, that one. So, okay, so for example, say in, in, in your method, you have these four, right? Timelines, tabs, filters, and modal. Mm -hmm. What exactly are these? I mean, you would have instantiation of say one modal or a lot of modals. Like, how does that? How do you make like say one page has you know one modal and another sure. page has three? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't use the exact same yeah. setup. So this kind of gets back to what he was asking before. Like, this is where it could be completely custom JavaScript, where mm -hmm. you're just writing on this modal object. You have a bunch of different methods. Or the init, init method could be as simple as just calling the modal plugin. Gotcha. So you're initial, initializing just that modal plugin on the pages that have modal plugins. Okay. So it could just be like dot modal, call the dot modal, call the modal plugin. Mm. But other times it could be we're custom building a modal outside. It's just a bunch of methods, and we're that's what we're calling. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of depends. Yeah. All your listings of candles between these Sorry, can you say that louder? So is there any way to establish some, some sort of communication between uh, two plugins? Between two plugins? Yeah. Uh, I mean, since if you're writing plugins like this, you have access to the class that you've created the plugin with. Since you've created a, like a class uh, way back where. So here, since you're creating a plugin like a class, and you can say that you want that list select object to be available to other plugins. So if somebody else wanted to use the list select object inside of their plugin, they could. There's no reason they they could just create their own object. You can also use events, right? Yeah. 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 So when you're using dependencies. Sorry, what did you say? How do you manage dependencies between different plugins? Like. Um. <coughs> Like I said, for most marketing sites, you don't usually have that many. I mean, you've got a bunch of plugins, and you've got kind of this main application file that's executing all the, the code. Um, I mean, there are some cases where you've got like polyfills, and you've got a bunch of other stuff. And it's just, I mean, you just throw it all in, and it gets combined and minified, and you've got your one JavaScript file. Um, we've been playing a little bit with require.js to do dependency management, but Sometimes it feels like overkill on just marketing sites. I mean, we're just doing DOM manipulations. It's like, it's not I feel like it's kind of finicky, too. Yeah, it gets kind of nuts. Yeah. What is passing undefined in uh, Oh, so that's just because you could change what undefined means. So we're just undefined in our scope is always undefined. So if some crazy third party code that you have to drop in at the last minute does something undefined and breaks all your JavaScript. Just kind of extra protection. The, he's, actually, he's actually explicitly not. Yeah. <laughs> Down below. Sorry. I don't know if you can see. Yes, yeah. 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 You have a question? Yeah. When you <laughs> refer, you will you refer like window dot site dot list select to create the object mm -hmm. the constructor. Okay. Yep. And then if you want to. So basically, you can just say window.listSelect equals listSelect, and then that listSelect is available to anyone else that wants to use it since it's on the window object itself. Oh, it goes up. Yeah, since we've, since we've added it as a property on the window, then you can access that functionality from anywhere that has access to window. But did, uh, isn't our idea to you know, like uh, group our functions in namespace? 
the way I'd be adding it to window. So, I mean, that's just kind of so it's available to everyone. Typically, we wouldn't add it to window either. We would do like site.classes.listSelect or something like that. So we have an object that contains all of our classes. If we're doing something like this, we're creating classes and adding it to something else. So even this way, like it is available to everyone, right? If, if you make it, you don't have to make it available to any, everyone, yeah, but you when can. When you say like window.site, so anything that comes mm -hmm. under it is available to everyone, right? Yes. Okay. It's just available under the site namespace. Anybody else? Questions, anything? Yep. And what is your module name? Um, display I didn't have, no, I had a little bit of room. You know, I just couldn't fit everything on the slide. Um, we do use strict in, in our JavaScript. Um, but, you know, I already had to make some slides that were like scrolling and stuff. Um, but we do use it. Uh, yeah, we do like, um, like Sublime Text 2 has like a say on save do run lint. We do that kind of stuff too. Anybody else? I'll put the slides up um, somewhere and tweet a link to them. And then. They're confidential. Yeah, and then my Twitter name is Trevor underscore Davis, so I'll, I'll tweet it and throw it up there too. And then Greg said they'll show it also. <laughs> All right, thanks again for coming, guys. Uh, it's an awesome turnout. We're really excited. Uh, let us know on the, what's that? Announced jQuery 2.0. Oh, that's right. Beta 3? <laughs> no. No. They have, no. Out, did it happen while I was here? Today. No, uh, 2.0 today. today. All right, 2.0 dropped today. So, you know, install it, let it break. Don't forget that thing that fixes all the problems <laughs> that you can put in before you let it break. Um, yeah, that's very exciting. Thank okay. you. So, jQuery 2 is out. Don't use it if you care about it. Don't care if you use it about it. Come on, we gotta stop sometime, right? Like, give up on I. Uh, feel free to hang out. Like, we've got the space until like 9, 9 30, whatever. And uh, there's still a lot of empanadas, so put some in your pocket. They're only a little greasy. Uh, and take some home. Thanks again. And if you're interested in a job, just let me know or whatever, and I can try to hook up with whoever. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, man. That was awesome. Thanks for being on the head up. Do you hear anything? I will. Thank you. You take away. I feel the same. Take away.